Welcome to the Potter Block site, April 28th, 2014. There was a massive cloud of americium and plutonium released into the air at least an hour before the Department of Energy has admitted it at the WIP facility. And the indication we have that this occurred comes from this accident investigation report. Uh, there is a timeline which shows, and we'll link it here, that at uh, February 14th at 22.50, security reported a green burst and arcing noise at the utility yard. I'll just show you that map. Here's the whip facility. This is the exhaust. This is where the radioactive plutonium and americium cloud came out. Came over this arc, this uh, electrical substation. It was coming out here initially at uh, 260,000 cubic feet per minute. And it stagnated, slowed down. By the time it got over this substation here, it took a little while, but uh, once the concentrations got high enough for the americium to ionize the air, this started arcing and popping, causing a green burst, which was reported by, uh, by the uh, site security and which the facility site manager went to investigate it. Unfortunately for them, they didn't understand what the hell was going on because this thing worked like a giant bug zapper, drawing these guys in like insects into the middle of this uh, americium cloud, which um, basically these people face a slow and agonizing death from this thing. Yeah, it's not certain, but they, but they do face it. And uh, they can thank the people at DOE here who took out the real-time live monitors out of the exhaust for not warning them about what happened here. Now, <clears throat> that's the short of it. We're going to get into a little bit of detail here in this video and uh, go through the report. But uh, what that means for the rest of uh, Carlsbad is at least an hour prior to what the DOE has admitted this site was just spewing out americium and plutonium, a huge cloud of it. And this occurred full rate at least an hour before the earliest time period they had met. So let's look at uh, the blog site. Let's go into just a little bit of detail here what happened. We'll go in a little bit longer. But, uh, you know, based on our analysis of of this DOE report. Yeah, it's this electrical substation ended up operating exactly like a screaming Geiger counter with each pop and green burst telling people to get the hell out of there. The radioactively ionized air allowed electrical arcing to occur across the substation resulting in the WIP site security reporting that green burst. This is the same scientific principle that Geiger counters are based on. But more than that, the americium that was released in that cloud, americium is used specifically for the purpose of creating such electrical arcs and that discharge effect in smoke detectors. In a smoke detector, they use the americium to produce a continuous state of such ionization electrical discharge. And then when smoke interrupts that ionization, the smoke detector goes off. The problem is, is that WIPS personnel didn't recognize what that substation was telling them. Moreover, if DOE recognized what happened at that substation, they are not admitting it. We suspect DOE only included the mention of what happened at the substation because they had to explain why the facility site manager was near the exhaust shaft ready to to manually turn on the HEPA filters after the underground alarm site has sounded. But now who can blame DOE for seemingly hiding the facts? After all, disposing of weapons grade plutonium and americium is national security. Not to mention the millions of dollars of legal claims and settlements the government will have to pay out to those security guards and that site manager if they get good lawyers. But again, as we said, those guys, 
they didn't know what was going on at that uh, electrical facility. They, they called up the uh, electrical uh, producer. They said nothing was wrong. <sighs> I tell you. But what's even worse about this is, is that they didn't recognize what was happening at the, uh, at the electrical substation. They didn't believe the alarms when they were going off or underground were real. It wasn't until 11 hours later, by which time these people were sent home without any radiation testing taking place, that the site people went out to uh, one of the filter stations above ground and actually took a measurement reading 4.4 million dis disintegrations per minute. And that's when they realized they had a real situation. Now, those of you who have read this, accident investigation report this is a good time for you to ask or think about you know, why why the underground continuous air monitors didn't alarm until 23 minutes after that green burst was first noticed at the electrical substation the simple answer is is that substation was appropriately sized to instantaneously respond to the concentration of americium and plutonium present. On the other hand, the underground continuous air monitor, and here's a picture of one actually taken underground at the uh, what facility. This thing only samples a very small volume of air taken from a very large movement of air. The sampling size and rate is unlikely to be suitable to rapidly detect such a release. And we discussed this in some detail, and we have a link to that here. But there's more to it than that. If you notice this thing, this air intake's only about six feet off the ground here. The tunnel height inside the WIP facility is approximately 12 feet minimum, I believe. So this is like hanging a smoke detector in your house midway up the wall instead of on the ceiling. This nuclear event that occurred likely exothermic, meaning fire slash explosion. So the radioactive materials would have been flowing like an invisible smoke cloud at the top portion of the tunnel, out of reach of the cam's air intake. So what had to happen was it had to the, re the release had to go on long enough for the uh, radioactive materials to build up inside and slowly drop down to where that uh, air intake is in the middle up side of the wall here. And eventually enough radioactivity fell low enough in the tunnel that the continuous air monitor was able to detect the radioactive buildup on its filters. Now another thing you consider is this, these filters uh, change out automatically. And during that change-out period, they're also non-functional. So depending on when it was changing filters, that cam would not have sounded at all. And since the radiation is being trapped on a filter, it takes some time to build up on that filter before it's actually noticed. But once the alarm went off, and the alarm was set off to go to, to trigger what's known as, as a derived air concentration, uh, which should normally be one or below, it's set to go off at 30, uh, 30 DAC per hour. If you look at this chart here, this is taken from the accident report. You can see the values go up into the hundreds of thousands of DAC per hour. There's even a point here when the radiation levels got so high that the detector became saturated and could not report the radioactivity properly anymore and it reported as a low value. At this point, the equipment did recognize that it was malfunctioning and sent off a notice upstairs to uh, uh, the managers. And uh, because of that malfunction, they sh uh, the report indicates they shut off the alarm, but they didn't actually shut off the monitor itself because they continued recording here what happened. There's also some other interesting features here. Is that uh, the alarm itself went off here, I believe, at the 11.14. And then you can see right around 11.21, it pops up. So between 11.14 and 11.21, that's when the uh, air filters, not the air filters, but the fans automatically switched over to a slower speed fan. 
they had to switch over to a slower feed, a slower speed fan, so as to not overpower the HEPA filters. Uh, but the HEPA filters did not come on automatically because somebody had to go up outside this exhaust facility and turn valves to manually divert the air coming out of the facility into those HEPA filters. And that didn't happen until approximately 10 minutes after the alarm sounded. So if we look at that timeline real quick, and we wrote it down here. Let's see. Oh, let's look at it. So at 22.50, that's when the arcing happened. At 23.10, the energy company told them they didn't detect anything wrong at their end. At uh, three minutes later after this, that's when the, uh, the rad alarm went off after the energy company told them everything was okay. That is approximately 23 minutes after the green burst and arcing noise was detected. Um, a minute after the alarm went off, a second high high alarm went off. Ten minutes later is when the uh, facility site manager went out and uh, opened those uh, uh, dampers here to redirect the airflow. Uh, once this alarm here went off, that's when the fan speed changed. And you can see what's occurring here is that uh, when the fan speed changed, the amount of oxygen reaching the fire decreased and it became more of a smoky, billowy nuclear fire. And not only that, since there was lower airflow going through, there was more radioactive material being deposited in a smaller amount of air, which, mean it became, which meant it became more readily detectable. So what happens is, as it slows down, the fire begins to billow, becomes more smoky, drops down from the ceiling. As it drops down to the ceiling to a point where it looks like here about six feet up, that it finally can reach into the uh, uh, continuous air monitor, that's when the values started going explosive. They just went straight up into the hundreds of thousands of uh, drived air concentrations. Now, the description of what I'm giving here about the smoking occurrence, this exact same phenomenon phenomena was noticed on the February 5th fire that occurred underground. That supposedly was a non-nuclear fire, but they also turned on the HEPA filters for that operation. And when they did that, when they turned on those HEPA filters and they slowed down the air, that's when the fire became smoky and the workers started having smoke inhalation problems. Lucky those guys didn't die of smoke inhalation at that point. Had workers been underground during the February 14th event, when the switch over to HEPA filters would have turned on, that smoke inhalation would have turned into radiation poisoning. As for Carlsbad and all the people downwind of WIP, the 214 nuclear fire was much worse than is being reported by DOE. And it happened at least an hour earlier than DOE has postulated. All in all, the DOE report is extremely poor in analysis, and those that submitted it should be ashamed. It's clear that the DOE is doing all it can to underreport what happened at WIP, and their mathematical effestications of the environmental radiation levels above ground, which they based on technical procedures which tend to peanut butter out radioactive concentrations over the sampling period instead of when the incident occurred. It's a type of lying which serves to significantly underreport which what occurred. It's unconscionable, unconscionable and sinful for people to call themselves engineers and scientists to lie to people like that, to lie with math. And we've discussed that previously in some detail. But it's obvious to us that WIP is unsafe for its workers and the public and that it will remain so until the true issues are addressed.